the way we want to run this today is we're going to, as I'm, we're going to invite, I'm going to ask JJ some questions and JJ is going to just kind of riff a little bit about his experience. I invited JJ first just to tell some background about himself because a lot of people here do know JJ because a lot of people here have met JJ, know JJ is beautiful himself. And he's been involved as he, as a CEO of Israel Maven, you know, numerous trips from Bethel and Beth Meyer and all the, across the country. So a lot of us know JJ well, but not all of us do. So I want JJ to give a little more background, who he is, what a little bit of his background, um, in, in in Israel, et cetera, his family, and then talk, of course, about his military service, and then, of course, his experience. Two things I want to say is that uh, we want to create a safe space here. We recognize that there are people here that don't have all the same opinions about everything. This is the Jewish community, even though in this moment we are extraordinarily unified in our concern and deep care for, for the Jewish people, for Israel. We recognize our differences. I want to remind everybody that JJ is speaking for himself. No one is saying that he speaks for anyone beyond himself. With someone he's a trusted friend, he's someone I adore and love, um, and I believe in and care deeply. But if you, for some reason, something he shares uh, touches you one way or the other, and you feel that this is something you don't feel comfortable with for whatever reason, I'm going to remind you that you can leave this call at any time. <laughs> but this is not the time for arguing or debating or telling someone, you know, what you did. And when it does come time for questions, which we will allow, I want to remind everyone this is a time for questions. This is not time for statements. It's important to use the, the word I. This is how I experience, not how you or this or that person. This is my experience. And to ask questions of curiosity. Uh, I, I really believe that we can do this here. I, I know we can, but I want to also recognize that we're all very emotional, including me. Okay. I'm very emotional. This is a very upsetting, difficult time. And something could set us off, even if we are not aware. So take a deep breath. Um, what we're going to do here, me and Anna have created a game plan. We're going to start with the chat open. That's our goal, say to open. And if you're in the chat and you feel you want to express something that isn't meaningful to you, then feel free. But I want to remind you, this is not a time for arguing, debating, making a point, saying how someone's a fool. That's not the time for this. The chat can be things like, I can't hear you. Could you say that again? Or, or oh, JJ, that hurts my heart that I heard that. I need to let you know that it breaks my heart. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, but this is not a time for debating the chat, and we will close down the chat, God forbid, if we have to. We don't want to, but we will. Last thing is that for questions, we're going to ask you to direct message those questions to me and Anna. We will take all the questions together, and then we will select them, you know, because some of them will bunch together or be duplicate to ask JJ and, and make sure we, we make our time go well. The goal is to have this done probably by around 1130 latest, because um, that's enough time for us to want to be sensitive to JJ's time as well. Okay. So without further ado, let us begin and unmute JJ. Oh, JJ is unmuted. JJ, thank you so much. I want you on behalf of all of us here, we are holding you and your family and loved ones and really all of Israel in our hearts. We're deeply grateful for your time. Um, I can only imagine how challenging this is. What I ask you to do first is just tell a little about yourself and then basically feel free to share what your perspective is. The title of this is What is Life in Israel Right Right Now? It's a very large question. Um, and then after some time, perhaps I'll, I'll tease a few questions out just to kind of bring up certain points. And then after that, we will open it up. Okay, my friend. First of all, I'm very, very, very moved by by your presence here. I see a lot of uh, names that I know from uh, previous trips that we've had and multiple times. Um, and it just moves me in general, um, the support that we've been getting um, from you know, international, you know, non-Israeli Jews, and especially, especially the North American Jewry has been embracing us so much. And it's been really a, a, something for comfort for here in Israel that uh, the embracing that we're getting from all around the Jews from, from North America and all around the world, um, it's needed. And if you don't think that everything that you do, just an email or a WhatsApp or uh, whatever you guys do, uh, it's 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 very comforting for us. Um, all I can say is two words: Am Israel Chai, and I can also say Kol Israel Aravim Zelaze. All the Jews around the world are connected, and especially at times like this, this is when we are together. Um, before I start a little bit about myself, um, this is ho it's horrible what happened, and um, it will be um, this event. It will go down in history for centuries about what happened on this day. Um, there's not a home that hasn't been affected here in Israel, and I'll get to that later. Um, but one thing that I will start off with on a good side, 
that not only um, the support that we're getting from, from the Jews around the world, but even here in Israel, we put our differences aside and everybody here, everybody has is putting in from their pockets, from their time, from their whatever it is, from their homes to help with what's going on here. If it's to help with the the families that had somebody that was killed or murdered um, or their families have someone missing uh, or they're in captive or they have kids in the army or just a collective help to our soldiers that if you think about it, 300,000 soldiers have been deployed. Um, that's, you know, um, almost, I would say, 5% of our of the Jewish community in Israel. If you think about it, that's pretty unbelievable. People stopped their trips from all around the world, left everything they had, and they got on the plane, and they and they just came here because they knew it was the time to come. Um, so I'm starting on a good side. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, as you know, I, I have a company called Israel Maven. Uh, we've run, uh, I think, five or six trips for uh, Beth Meyer and about, I think, two or three trips for Beth El and Durham. Um, and uh, we're uh, very close connections with Rabbi Eric Solomon, with Rabbi uh, Dan Graber. Um, and um, and I was born in Canada, and I moved uh, to Israel when I was uh, seven years old, not on my own. I, I was a true Zionist, but I was too young to come on my own. Um, we came with my family. The reason we came was Zionism. That's all All my father said, or their love of Israel. They left a, a very comfortable life, a very good life in Canada. And they said, no, this is not the place for us. The place for us is in Israel, whatever that means. And that line that my father said to me carries me till this day, um, especially on these days that are happening here when people are saying, you know, maybe this is... You know, whatever happened to the Zionism that is the safe home for, for the Jewish people, I still think that's true and even more true now uh, than ever. Uh, excuse me for one second. My dog needed it. Um, I grew up here in Israel um, in an Orthodox background, um, you know, learning a lot about, about Judaism and Zionism. I grew up in a Zionist home. Um, everything about us was about Israel. Uh, it's a beautiful country, and it's a wonderful. Uh, eventually, I became a tour guide as well. Um, and that I guess uh, shows where my my passion is. Um, but uh, I went through the army um, three years in 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 regular duty, and then another twenty years as a commander in uh, in uh, reserve du duty. So that was till I was about 38, 39 years old, about fourteen years ago. Um, and uh, I was a commander in an infantry unit called Golani. Um, and uh, then the army didn't need me anymore. Um, and then uh, I had time to focus on my on my family and my uh, career, I guess. And um, I grew up, I, I have um, uh, four kids. Um, and I'm trying to raise them the way I was raised in the same way, in the same love and passion for their Judaism, and the same passion and love for Israel and Zionism, which in my opinion go hand in hand. Um, and, um, today I have, uh, a son who is, I haven't heard from him in, uh, about five days. Um, he's in the South, in Gaza, not in Gaza. I don't know. Um, he's, um, just finishing his, uh, officer's course. Uh, he's been two years in the army, um, and he is down South, uh, either near Gaza or in Gaza. I don't know. Um, but he's doing what, what he, um, is trained to do is to protect Israel. Um, God, you know, you know, I hope that he comes back safely to us. Um, and, uh, we worry about him, of course, all the time. We don't, um, sleep too well at night. Um, but they just went in recently. So until now it's been partially okay. Uh, Wednesday we spoke to him, that was the last time, and he seemed to be very motivated, very, um, uh, he says, uh, he says to me, Daddy Abba, he says to me, yeah, I said to him, I don't want you to go in, he says, yes, but, you know, I'm a soldier, this is what I was trained for, my job to train, my job is to defend Israel, and this is the time that it needs defending, and so that's what he's doing, um, and I, of course we pray for him and all these soldiers together, I have another 
um, seven nephews and a niece that were drafted. Um, and um, then I have a daughter who's also in the army and she just dra got drafted in uh, two months ago and she was, instead of doing her course, she was taken to uh, uh, protect um, um, some towns and settlements in uh, the West Bank. Uh, there's a big fear of of um, a an uprising from all fronts. Uh, I'm sure you know about the north and Hezbollah and from Syria, there's been a couple of rockets and from Yemen, they try to shoot some rockets. And so there's fear here also in terms of, you know, the West Bank and in terms of the East Jerusalem Arabs and even the Israeli Arabs. There's, you know, everybody's fear of, of this, what's going on now. And that's why the whole country is in a war mo mode. Um, and my third, my third son, he's in high school and he's been busy with his scouts collecting um, uh, things for, for soldiers, collecting things for, for um, uh people that, that live in the uh, area of Gaza and had to move. Um, and that's what he's been doing with his friends. Um, my wife, who who does uh, alternate uh, healing, uh, she's been going around uh, hotels that have now been, um, uh, they're not uh, hosting tourists because there are no tourists in Israel. They're hosting uh, different communities from the Aza, Gaza area. Uh, every hotel here in Israel is hosting uh, one community or another, if it's Derot or the Kibbutzim or wherever it is, and she's been going there on a daily basis for an hour or two hours to to work with four to six-year-old kids who are supposed to be in their kindergarten right now, but of course, there is no kindergarten for them. They, they're away from home, so she goes and do, does activities for them. So you can see that we're, we're, we're not the only ones who are doing this stuff, but everybody is. Everybody is involved in what's going on in in uh, in what's going on in Israel right now. Um, I have, um, when I finished the army, I, I, I used to work for many, many years for the conservative movement. I used to run their youth programs here in Israel for many, many years. A big, in my opinion, huge Zionistic uh, uh, job. It was, uh, it was fun to do. And I worked with schools. I worked with youth. I worked with uh, adults. I worked with all kinds of stuff as a as an educator. Um, I was a shaliach, an emissary for the Jewish agency in Los Angeles for a few years, uh, working with the Jewish community uh, in Los Angeles and the area. Um, and um, when I finished all that work, I decided that I wanted to create something of my own. And that's when Israel Maven was born in 2010. And since then, we've been organizing trips for mainly Jewish, North American um uh, it could be, you know, synagogues, it could be uh, missions, it could be bar mitzvah trips, whatever it is, that's what we've been doing um, to try to give them the best experience possible to connect them to their to the land of Israel. That's a little bit about me um, and uh, and what we've been doing uh, on, um, in the last few weeks. I've recently um, volunteering to the local emergency, um, I don't know how to say it in English, uh, I would say emergency group that jumps in case something happens. Um, believe it or not, I'm going for training um, with uh, with uh, ammunition and, and weapon in a couple of days. And we're going to be part of a group of, of 15 who will be guarding our neighborhood in case something happens. This has never happened in my whole, you know, in my lifetime where we had to think about our safety here in Jerusalem. Um, but we are. Uh, every scenario is possible. Um, you know, when uh, rockets have been uh, flying over our heads, unfortunately, um, and I am saying this with the deepest sorrow, is that uh, the some of the local Arabs here in the Arab uh, villages and the towns and the neighborhoods of Jerusalem went out and cheering and, and starting shooting up uh, um, um, fireworks um, when this whole th thing happened on, on the 7th of October. And uh, we just have to be careful. We have to be careful because we we don't know where this can can uh, can open up to. Um, our enemies are waiting for us to be weak and to be hurt uh, for uh, for them to rise. Um, and so we have to be ready uh, for any any scenario. And I'm sorry to say that we've gotten to this position. Um, I would like to go back a little bit to what I said before that uh, it's pretty amazing about what the Jewish community. Uh, around the world and specifically in North America have done for us. And also here, the, the local Israelis, uh, we're, we are as one. Um, it's funny because about a month ago, um, the country was so split 
politically and, and religiously uh, like never before. And in one day, all that has been forgotten. Everything. It's like now we're one unit. Um, I'm not saying that won't go back to what it is because we're Jews and that's how we are. We, we, we like to argue, as Rabbi Solomon said before. Um, but right now, there's no differences. There's no separation. There's no none of that. We're all together uh, because the enemy is cruel. The enemy is subhuman. The enemy is, is somebody that wants to uh, destroy us. Um, they don't differentiate. And I'm sure you all know this between old people and children and babies and um, non-Jews that live here in Israel. They couldn't care less. Um, and now we have to get together to, to fight this enemy together, together with your help as well. Um, I don't have to go into the details about what happened that day. I'm sure you're all in the news and you know what's going on. But I would like to tell you a little bit about the feeling here in Israel. Um, the emotions are, it's like a roller coaster. Um, I, I don't know how to express that even more. Um, between um, anger, uh, fear, and sadness on one hand. On the other hand, um, pride and um and um uh unity and um happy to be part of such a amazing uh people and um and how we're we're dealing with this as a, as a, as a people um that for the first now we're already in our going into our fourth week already but the first i would say two and a half weeks were very 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 difficult um i think right now Israel is still in a state of shock. We don't still understand what hit us. We get it, but we don't understand. We're not yet in trauma. We're not reached that time yet. We're still in a state of shock. And um, the trauma comes afterwards. And we all know that's going to happen and what that means and how we're going to deal with it. But right now we're still in a state of shock. Um, I spent the first two weeks going from funeral to funeral, to shiva to shiva, from uh, supporting uh, families uh, that um, their loved ones have been abducted, um, and to supporting families that uh, they sent their husbands and fathers and brothers and sisters to, to, to be sent to the front line, um, helping, like I said, the communities that had to be evacuated from the north and from the south. Um, my community, just like Beth Meir, we lost uh, our close, close friends. Their son was at that uh, music festival that night, and he he was killed as a hero. He saved about 20 lives because he was in a a, um, a migunit, a place that's uh, safe from the from the explosions that happened. These safe homes um, with another 20 people, and he uh, was in front, and um, they were throwing hand grenades at them, and he was throwing them back. Uh, at some point, he couldn't um, do it anymore, and he was killed. But they didn't find out until a week later, uh, because there are so many, um, there are so many um, um, dead that they they didn't have enough people to to just cover everything. So it took them a week to find that out. Um, we're very close friends with them. I, I was at their house twice a day during the shiva. Uh, other very, very close friends of ours, uh, you might have heard their name because they've been very active on social media, John and Rachel Polin, their son Hirsch was abducted. Um, Rachel and John actually met because of me. Um, I didn't, I accidentally introduced them. Uh, they're both from Chicago. Um, I taught Hirsch for his bar mitzvah. Um, uh, believe it or not, Rachel, his mother worked for Israel Maven for this past year. Um, so we're very, very close to them as well. Um, and, and then just other people that I that I know that their kids are missing or were killed. Um, I went to a funeral in Mount Herzl, and I know that most of you have been to Mount Herzl. Whenever I got to Mount Herzl, there's this empty lot there. And I said, you know, I always say, this empty lot, let's hope that it always stays empty. Uh, unfortunately, if there's no room there left anymore because it just piles and piles and piles of, of new, of new uh, soldiers who were killed. Um, and it's just... Devastating, devastating this whole thing. The feeling, oh, though, is that we're together with especially the families that lost their, their loved ones and the ones that lost their homes, and especially the right now, the ones that have their kids, parents, sisters, brothers uh, in captive with the Hamas. 
um, on a government level, um, I'm, you know, I'm trying to listen and to understand what's going on. Um, the main two objectives right now is to uh, bring down the Hamas with this least amount of um, innocent uh, um, um, casualties um, and also to bring back our hostages. Those are the two main objectives. Nothing else matters right now. And whatever needs to be done in order to do that, our country will do. Um, and maybe that's one of the reasons why um, Israel was very um, hesitant before going into Gaza, trying to to um, get as much information, intelligence as possible about where the hostages are. From the intelligence that I know, the Hamas don't even know how many people they have because Jihad Islami has some of them. They have some of them. First, private people are holding hostages. This is what we know. Uh, Israel sent leaflets around saying, if you're holding hostages, let them go or else we're going to get to you. Um, that's how chaotic is over there right now. Uh, that they, they don't even know who the hostages necessarily are. Um, and that's our main objectives. We're embracing the families that have lost their their loved ones and embracing the ones who their loved ones are probably in Gaza right now, all that we know of. The information is still lacking. Hamas, of course, won't let in Red Cross or anybody to let to see how they're doing or who's there or who's not there. Um, uh, but we're trying to get as much information as we can as possible. Um, so the feeling here in Israel is, like I said, a roller coaster of emotions. Um, and, you know, we we hear every single day of the bravery of people on that day, of what they've done to save people's lives and sacrifice their own. Hundreds of stories, hundreds and hundreds of stories like that, no less. Um, some of them became international and famous, like this woman who who served coffee to the to the terrorists and held them for hours upon hours until they came and they were and they were killed. Um, but uh, that's like one of the famous, but just small ones. Um, every single kibbutz and yeshuv and moshav that's around Gaza has their own story. Um, some that were not touched because of bravery, and some that were totally destroyed because. I don't know the answer to that. Um, so we're 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 really surrounded by all these stories that give us koach, that give us strength to say, "Wow, look at these stories! Our people are amazing, amazing people." I have people here, neighbors of mine, all over, that are hosting families from Zderot, that are hosting, um, that are giving their their extra home because they have an extra home. They said, "You know what? I want a family from Otef Aza to stay there." And they're putting up people, and we're giving them food, and we're giving them challah for Shabbat, and we're and we're cleaning up their houses, and we're bringing whatever we can. It's just pretty amazing the amount of giving that this country is doing, and the amount of help also getting from North America. And um, we'll need a lot of it. There's still a lot to come. There's still a lot to. Unfortunately, there's still much ahead of us. And um, all I can pray for is to bring our boys back home safely and to get the job done um i think i'm gonna stop there if that was okay um and i'm happy to to elaborate or answer any questions that you would uh like jj i i mean there's no adequate words to express just simply toda thank you for sharing from your heart your experience your literal family on the line your community your friends co-workers it's jerusalemites um it's it's hard, frankly, to take it all in. How how much you and you're just one person, I understand, but just one Israeli is experiencing. Uh, to multiply that by, you know, millions of people, it's hard to even fathom uh, what what's what you're experiencing. I, I just want you to know, that, of course, we are very grateful you're sharing with us, and we're standing with you, just like heart to heart. Let me. There's a couple questions that that I I want to just kind of go a little further with that that. Uh, and you can judge by the way you can feel free to pass if something does not feel like you want to talk about it or you don't feel you're adequate or it's too hard to talk about because jj you are i mean you're jj tour guy jj is an educator jj is a scholar jj is involved in community jj knows both you know this is this is your in many ways you are a translator for us of what you know what we can't sense some things that happening as a congregational rabbi that i'm hearing from my congregants and by the way so also ring in my own neshama some fear 
that this is an existential moment for Israel, that there's a fear that this is not just a horrific flare up. Well, if that's the right word, I don't know what massacre, but that there's existential concern for Israel's continued vitality. Um, would you say that's something you feel, or would you say that other Israelis feel? Would you say that would be an exaggeration? Um, I, of course, us being out in the diaspora, we are reacting to what we sense from afar. So it can be not necessarily accurate. But I have been asked that question by Karians. Is this an existential moment to Israel's future as a independent, sovereign country? What do you say to that? There's not one person that I know that doesn't think about that. I'm not saying I'm not saying you know it's likely, but it's not impossible. Um, the idea that the Hamas wanted to do, what do they want to achieve by this Hamas? Do you think they can win a war against us? They know that at the end of this, after killing and massacring, um, whatever you want to call it, uh, pogrom that they did to us uh, and kill over a thousand four hundred people and the and counting, they were not going to achieve anything by this. They they knew that they were going to screw, oh, sorry for the word, the rest of the of the Arabs living in Gaza Strip because they couldn't care less about them. They used them as human shields. So what did they want to achieve by this? They were hoping to hurt us really badly, which they achieved. And at the same time, Hezbollah would see the weakness that we're in. They would raise up their arms and attack us from the north. And that's why the whole north has been evacuated. Iran would see this as well, take advantage of this and do whatever they need to do, even though both Hezbollah and Hamas are proxies of Iran. And at the same time, the local Arabs in East Jerusalem, in Israel, the full Israeli Arabs, the West Bank Arabs, all of them would raise up their arms at the same time and within destroy Israel. That's what Hamas was hoping for. And I'm sure... And I know that they um, were told at some point by different parts of these groups that they would join in once, you know, this would start up. And it hasn't happened yet. Yet. Maybe they're waiting. Maybe they're afraid of America. Maybe they're afraid of what we did to them. Maybe there's pressures that we don't know about. Could it happen? It could. But uh, right now it's unlikely. I would not say it's impossible at all. And that is why right now me, you know, Alta Cocker JJ is taking up a gun and and uh, I haven't oh, no, don't have it yet. And I'm going to be part of my, uh, you know, the security of my neighborhood because I fear that something like this could happen. And I'm not the only one. Um, I have to, you know, say uh, amazing words about President Biden um, and his, his warm words, his his. Uh, his support and the fact that uh, he brought the um, um, what do you call it the uh, uh, what's the word the they noseta um, the, the the carrier the aircraft, aircraft carriers yeah. aircraft carriers here to say to to Hezbollah listen if you get involved we're here and um, I don't know if that's the reason why they didn't attack or it was but it anyways it sends a message um to to our enemies um and so like i said we're at, right now after what happened we feel that anything can happen anything can happen do i fear for my life at this moment no i don't i don't i live in jerusalem um things are trying to go back to normal here in jerusalem specifically um it could change in one second but uh, this week, the kids went back to school for the first time after a few weeks. Um, the the malls are starting to open up. None of the fun stuff that you won't have any theaters opening, movie theaters or restaurants for the evenings or places to do fun because people are not in that mode. People are not interested in, in enjoying themselves and going out to movies. They're not. They're really, really not. But some of the necessities, necessary things are, are, are opening up. Um, but uh, we're, of course, fearful. We're fearful. And when people came home from their trips from all around the world to go to the army, the, the slogan is, that we're fighting for our home. 
JJ, first of all, thank you so much for the very powerful words on multiple parts of this. I, I, another question Second that I want to ask you, KJ? Yeah. Yeah. JJ has a family probably right behind. And I, JJ, I, I think, do, are you describing what's called kitot akonanut? That's what it's called. I think the, they're remember. called in English something like, something like first response security first responders. First response security, like, exactly. Yeah, that's what, like that. that's the best, right? Right. So locally. Um, so uh, about the hostages, okay? I would say, speaking for myself, speaking for my congregants, there's a feeling amongst many of us, it's hard to breathe. Just thinking about one hostage. We hear, I don't know if you know, JJ, but there's a gentleman named Keith Siegel who was born in Chapel Hill. And his and his wife, Aviva, lived on Kfar Aza and were kidnapped and they're being held hostage right now. So our local senator and news has covered this local angle in our shul this Shabbat. And I imagine Beth Elder's doing something similar. We have dedicated a special seat specifically for Keith Siegel. Of course, it represents all of the hostages, but it's, it's to give a sense of the closeness here. But there's a feeling of just, I want to understand from you, what it's clearly there's a sense this, this would be like, it, it's hard to determine what's a worst nightmare. The, the entire experience is a worst nightmare, but the specific incident of the hostages is nightmarish to even consider. How how are you digesting the fact that right now and the the, the fear around that, the upset around it, and how to stay calm, I would say, or, or rational um, when this is happening? How would you say you or other Israelis are are able to to st say stay calm or or not? Is it something that completely um, is off the rails? It feels here there's an off the rails quality to it that's almost uncontrollable. That particular piece. Not that, by the way, the killings aren't horrible. I'm just saying this particular part. What would you say your experience of that or other, your community? Talked about digesting. We're not digesting this. It's it's something that is with us 24-7, the hostages. Um, and it's, it's the, you know, the, 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 the families of the hostages. I just was watching an interview with this woman who four members of her family are hostages, four of them, um, who are two kids, her husband, and I think her mother from Nil Oz. And I was listening to her. She was, she seemed very, you know, calm in the way she was speaking. And I know that her stomach is inside out. Just the thought of her two kids, I think they're one and three year old, in the hands of those animals, who's giving them um, who's changing their diaper? Who's giving them, you know, feeding them? Uh, they don't even have, they didn't start walking yet. So we can't digest this. It's something that's not digestible. In a war, there's hostages. But in a real war, there's no one and three-year-old hostages. There's no such thing as an 85-year-old Holocaust survivor's hostage. There is no such thing. This is, I don't even know the word of it. The whole country is behind the families of the hostages. We are. But both us and the families of the hostages know that it's not simple. It's not hocus pocus. Let's bring them home. There's a lot involved in bringing them home. How do you do it? How is it done? Is a negotiation even up on the table? Should we be negotiating with these animals? Is that even deserving to negotiate with these animals? And I will say that there is a, I mean, we are very, which is kind of uh, ironic a little bit, we are very trustworthy of the people making decisions. Do they want to get to a situation that we are strangling, not physically, Gaza and the Hamas at a point that they'll say, okay, 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 we'll give you your hostages back or some of them just pull back or just give us electricity or give us something, okay? Or are we hoping to go in with our soldiers and killing the terrorists one by one? until we get to the hostages, hopefully finding them alive, hopefully finding them, which is a whole separate story. 
Uh, you have to understand there's Gaza Shalmazda and Gaza Shalmata. There's the Gaza that we see, and there's a whole network of uh, a city below. That's that's where Hamas are hiding. And uh, they're, of course, taking all the food and, and uh, petrol and everything that's needed that the, the people above don't have. Um, so there's, and, and maybe that we will uh, try to capture as many terrorists as possible, not only kill them, so that we have a lot of them so that we can exchange at some point. We're trying to work internationally. Um, the non is, I mean, the, a lot of them with dual citizens, like you said, the one from Chapel Hill, and my friends John and Rachel Poland that have American, and there's a few Nepalese and Sri Lankans that that were that were here taking care of of, of the elderly in these kibbutzim that were kidnapped. Like we're trying to put international pressure on the other side. They're trying to put pressure on Qatar, who are supposed to be maybe the bridge between um, the normal Western, uh, I would say, uh, moral thinking to the non-moral animals that we're dealing with because they have been funding them for all these years. And Qatar can pay both sides. So no, we're not digesting this. This is something that's gonna be, and it's been 23 days since they've been kidnapped. And um, 20, 22, or this is the 23rd day. And um, it's gonna be more and more and more difficult as the time goes on. There are people that are injured there. There are people that need care. There's people with special needs, kids with wheelchairs that are there. Okay, special need kids. Can you believe that? They took special needs. I mean, I don't know if they knew that, but they were in wheelchairs and they took them with their wheelchairs. Like, what's going on with them? How are they dealing with this? Maybe they weren't and maybe they were shot because they couldn't deal with them. We don't know. We have no idea. So yes, this is, this is on everybody's uh, mind heart, tongue, we talk about it all the time. So so it, it's right. Uh, you asked, it's we, we can't uh, we can't digest this. This is a lot for us. It's not even uh, something that um, we can understand or nobody can understand in the world, I don't yeah. think. Thank you, JJ. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask one more question, then we're gonna invite people. If we want to send some questions to me and Anna, we'll we will we will call through them and bring them to JJ. JJ, so now Focusing, of course, you're speaking with, you know, American audience. I mean, this happens to be mostly North Carolinian, but um, and you, of course, you're, you've lived in this bridge in between, as you mentioned. You're originally from Canada. You've lived your your English is, of course, excellent. You you live in a community with a lot of Anglo's, and you 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 live in this cross section of in, in engaging and educating many tourists, but definitely North American tourists to to Israel. And you're aware, as you noted, that that I mean, you're following you media, I'm sure you're doing all that different stuff. You have, of course, noted that Israel is basically in a stage of still trying to, in shock, and still trying to I don't know, deal with the shock, or just be in shock, not to focus on ridding Hamas and getting back hostages. Everything else really is in a second, you know, sec separate or completely not next left, next on the on the ladder of important priorities. But I want to just see, to what degree are you seeing, hearing about what Israel is or Jews abroad, but also like the the international media aspect, um, American media, the BBC. I mean, there's been in this has been going on for years. Of course, it's not a new conversation, but there's been this 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 is a focus of a lot of us in our community here. As we are reading the New York Times, the CNN, the BBC, name it, all the internet stuff from TikTok to social media. There's so many narratives. There are significant rallies going on, obviously ours here in our community in support of hostages, but there's significant, large, loud pro-Palestinian rallies, if you want to call them that, because some of them appear to be pro-Hamas rallies, which is not necessarily the same as a pro-Palestinian like state. Clearly, it's not the same at all. Um, but this is a huge uproar around the world in these other capitals. How much would you say you or Israelis are aware or even care uh, would you say it's kind of like just it's irrelevant right now? It's like that's just something we're used to it and we just push it to the side, the UN type of stuff. Is it relevant? Does it matter? Does it does it affect Israeli psyche or morale? How would you say that international aspect, both Jewish and general, is playing a role, if at all? We are aware. We are disgusted by some of the media in the world. And Right now, we don't care. That's in short. 
Yes, we are very aware because Israel, as you know, is very uh, active on social media. So we see the differences between uh, BBC on one side and Fox News on the other side and CNN and Sky News and Al Jazeera. We get it all. Um, we see the protests for and against Israel. And all I can say right now is, and this is me talking, and I would say most of the people that I know, I don't know anybody who will say the other otherwise, is that anybody who right now protests Israel, in our eyes, is pure anti-Semitic. There's no question about it. How can you protest Israel at a time like this, with the scenes that have been shown to the world, you can put a blind eye and do whatever you want, but it's very hard to put a blind eye at what was seen that day. And you know what? The world hasn't seen the worst. There was a 47 minute video that I hope nobody of you ever sees. I don't want to see it. That was shown to the world media yesterday or a couple of days ago, and also yesterday, that made the world media cry, every single one of them. Um, scenes that should not be shown to anybody. Um, I can only imagine what was shown in that in that uh, short film that they showed. And anybody now who protests against Israel is just anti-Semitic. I'm sorry to be so um, straightforward about this and not black and white. I'm sure there's a gray area here, but that's how Israel's portraying it right now. It doesn't matter where you stand on the political map here in Israel today. That's how it's portrayed. And right now, Israel, I'm talking about the person on the street, could care less about it. Because right now, we're fighting for our home. We're fighting for Israel, for every little person here, for every home here, for everything. Because now is the time when our enemies try to destroy us. And our enemies that haven't acted yet are just waiting for the right moment to do it. How can you side with somebody who did these atrocities? We still don't understand that. Like we we're watching these things here in Israel and we don't understand. We don't understand how people could be protesting against Israel after this happens. Right now, we need to get our children and, and old people and special needs people back from the hostages and we will do anything to do that. And nobody, we, I mean, people can say whatever they want to say. And we know there's a lot of pressure. And I see the protests all around the world, including in college campuses in North America, which you know, I, don't, I have no words to, to, to express. Uh, you know, I'm, I know that it's, it's uh, groups of people that uh, I don't know where they're coming from and who they are. But uh, again, we know, we're aware, and we're disgusted. But again, we don't care. I know that it affects you guys a lot. And, um, you know, a lot of people, especially in, in uh, North Carolina, uh, work in the universities uh, and college campuses. I don't know how it's in Chapel Hill specifically, but we've heard about Harvard and about Columbia and about Ivy League uh, and Berkeley. It's it's just, sorry for using this word again and again, disgraceful and disgusting. So, but again, we're going to do what we need to do because it's it's if we don't do what we need to do, we'll be right back where we were before the August, October 7th, when, when the Hamas are just looking down on us, waiting waiting for us to, to we have to finish the job. To get it, I totally, I hear you here. Okay, let me, let me give me a couple questions here from our Hevra here. Um, we're going to wrap up with some, with a, what we can do at the very end. And Jay, just mentioned a little bit this, but we'll wrap that at the end. JJ, this is, may sound secondary, but I think it's an, it's a question I've also been asked and it's raised here in the comments here. The Israeli society has come to a complete stop, uh, you know, with one goal or two goals. Stop Hamas, destroy Hamas, get the hostages back. You, I know, because we worked through Israel Maven over, I've been here 19 years. I probably worked with you for 15 at least. I mean, your business specifically, which is based on tourism, is incredibly affected from COVID to wars to whatever this now I know that's secondary. Pikuach nefesh is first. I understand. We do. We have, but still, the economy of Israel is part of its greatness and it's it's a vitality and it allows it to thrive and obviously to pay for a lot of the military. It, it, it's a cycle of what supports, including people who are suffering. And I know that we're doing charitable work here in, in our community too. But I know that 
the economies can only last so long in this type of state of shock war, it appears. Now, I, I, I'm not an expert in the economy, but this question has been asked. What would you say is the economic thinking right now? Is there anything worrying about that? What would be some of the longer term thinking around that or consequences of that? Uh, is there anything that we can be aware of could help and specifically in the economic realm, not just the charitable realm, but like any that could be a role that we could play. But sp I know that's not the number one question, really more like how would that play out this economic consequence, especially if the war goes on for a very long time, which it very well may. What are your thoughts on that? I'll make it a short answer. Um, any war in any country has an effect on its economy, um, no matter where it is. And of course, here as well, when you know five percent not only are drafted, and you need to feed them, and you need to pay them, and you need to whatever it is, but you also are taking people away from their work. Uh, so nobody's working. Also, if you think about all these people that are supposed to be working and they're not working, um, so this is going to be a huge hit on Israel's e economy. Um, I know we'll get out of it. I know we'll come out of it. Um, I know that it's secondary to human life. But I believe that we'll be able to prevail and we'll be able to come out of this like we did with COVID and like we did with wars before. Uh, I really do hopeful. I'm hopeful of it. Um, of course, Israel Maven, you know, tourism is the first to be hit. Um, and um, we, we'll do whatever we need to do. You know, it's it's hard. We'll need to fire and we'll need to rehire and we'll need to figure out how to get out of this. But the time will come and we'll figure it out. But uh, but it's going to be a hit. And I know that the Ministry of uh, Economics um, um, is or the treasure, I would say, Treasury, uh, working on ways to salvage uh, Israel's economy. I know that the United States and other countries around the world are assisting Israel with help. Um, and hopefully we'll get out of this um, and we'll be able to pull through. I'm gonna. I'm gonna last. So the last question I'm gonna have is about what you know, what we can do specifically with which is. But let me one before. I'm just give you one opportunity to wax a little bit of the political scientist, and you will say, okay. And I recognize that you're you're just a citizen in this way. You're not a PhD in political science, and I recognize that you're you're you've said very clearly, like we're Israel's still in a state of shock. But there are questions that people ask around issues like the prior divisions that Israel was going through, that which you noted have closed within 24 hours, like it was back to save the country or defend the country. However, the, the, those tensions still are there. To what degree do you if they see it, but do you worry about that in terms of um, may have contributed to some of the weaknesses that led Hamas or other enemies? That's one question. And then uh, further, like kind of issues around what, please God, Hamas quickly and speedily is removed what is the thinking after that? Um, so I guess those two kind of things, what's, if we can think that far, and I think it's fair to say, Jay, to say, I'm not sure we can think that far. I can, I can accept that, by the way. But if you say it, anything on the future, anything about so what the circumstances were that brought us to this moment. Okay, so the first question I'll say that I don't think, yes, we were at a weak point because of our differences in Israel. But this attack has been planned much longer than our rifting in Israel. This has been in the works for a couple of years now, if not more. Um, they were learning us. They were learning our defensive. We were very, very high tech, very, you know, uh, technological and you know, computers and intelligence and all that stuff. And they attacked us on low tech. They attacked us on low tech. Simple guns, local bombs a little bit of strategics, and they got us. They used regular lines on phones, like with real lines, no internet, so we couldn't listen to what they were doing. They used low-tech, and they were planning this for two years. They were funded by Iran. Iran gave them all the necessary things. So Iran is, you know, they're a proxy of Iran. That's all they are. We need, at some point, we need to cut off the head and not just one of the hands. Um, I don't know how that's going to plan out, but that's what needs to be done. 
Um, so I don't think that had an, a direct effect. I think that maybe it pushed them a little bit more about when to do it, about this is the good time to do it. They're also weak. They're also divided. It's also Simchat Torah. It's Shabbat. They're weaker in the side. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what's going to hit them. They're disorganized at, when this happens. Um, to add to many other things, this party that suddenly you know they found out about and they said, okay, this is a good time to hit. Let's hit as many people as possible. So all these things brought it. I don't think it necessarily specifically had to do with what was going on in the country. Um, I hope that answers your question. For the long term, um, I'm not a political analyst, but I can say, and from what I understand, that the idea at the end of this is that the world, the United Nations, will decide, will run the country, or somebody will come, some sort of international figure to try to get them back on their feet and figure out how to um, get these people back um, to normal lives, whatever normal means today. Um, by the way, speaking of that, tours in Israel will never be the same again. If you're going to bring a synagogue trip, even in three years from now, it's going to be different from what it was after October 7th, 19, uh, 2023. It's not going to be the same. Ever. Just like it was after Yom Kippur. Yeah, I'm not making the differences. Same thing's going to happen now. It's going to be totally different. Um, our fear is Hamas, even though they're animals and they are um, subhumans and the way they brainwash their people, who can bring uh, um, to go and s cut off a kid's head? Who can, who can do that? Like we're trying, what's in their mind that, that would make them do that? And why I'm getting to this is because Hamas is not only people. It's a concept. And getting rid of a concept is not possible in one generation. It needs to be done from the root. And there needs to be some sort of um, entity that brings them back in their feet, but not only physically, not only food and places to live and all that kind of stuff, but also in terms of their thought, in terms of education, in terms of understanding the difference between right and wrong, to stop brainwashing kids from the age of six to hold a Kalachnikov in their hand. That is not the way. And the concept needs to be switched, but it'll take a whole generation to do. Unfortunately, this concept is not only in Gaza. It's also in East Jerusalem. It's also in the West Bank. It's also in... Arab countries around us, including going all the way to Malaysia and Indonesia and countries that hate us. They've never met an Israeli in their life and they hate us. Why? They've never met a Jew in their life and they hate Jews. How can that be? How can someone explain that? It's because they're brainwashed. And this concept of hating Jews and Israel, I'm putting them together because they are together is something that needs to be changed. Like I said, Hamas may be a leadership and, uh, of Gaza that needs to be wiped out, but it's also a concept. And that is going to be much harder to get rid of. And whoever takes over to Gaza to pick up the pieces and try to put them back together again needs to also train, change the concept or we're going to be back right where we started in 10 years from now. Well said, JJ. Well said. Okay, you've given us a lot here. We're going to do last last questions here. I'm kind of pulling together the last uh, kind of group. Basically, have dealt with specifically Israel Maven. We have a relationship not only with you, JJ. Thank God, but with the guides. You know, we've we've been guided by many amazing and and not and staff members. And so you've mentioned a bit like Rachel Poland, who I, I mean, I've followed because I know her from Pardes, and there's a lot of different connections we, a lot of us have with that particular family. But so there are people, can you talk a little bit about people in your circle of Israel, maybe that we might be connected to? And then just in general, you've noted that by sending notes and messages and just doing little mitzvahs to show our love and support to you, what else can we do uh, to help support you specifically, Israel Maven, and then generally what would you say would be some takeaway items, even from afar? I'd be totally selfish if I would say to you, listen, we need help. We need, we, of course, we're not in a great situation, but we're the last people that need help. 
really. We're not, you know, we'll deal with it. You know, we'll have to get rid of some of our staff and hopefully when this is over, rehire and hopefully we're still standing still. And if we're not, we're not, <laughs> you know, um, I look at this as, you know, even though it's, it's something that I built with my business partner, Zev, with our own hands and, um, you know, we'll do whatever we need to do. Um, what can we do to help? I'm going to go straight into the answer. And this is a great question. I think that there's three things I want to say about this. Number one is do not be silent. Do not be, um, what's the word? Um, be active, be active in social media, be active in um, the things that if you're on Facebook or you're on Instagram, or whatever you are, share your thoughts, say, this is wrong. The more that's out there, the more the world gets it. There's so many people there that are, couldn't care less. They saw it. Oh, that's terrible. But they go on with their normal lives. Okay. There are some people that are persuaded the other way. But if we, every single one of us is active and say, this is wrong. This needs to be done. The more it sinks into people. And especially in places like uh, North Carolina and places where, where there's not a huge Jewish community and your friends and your neighbors are non-Jewish and maybe they care, maybe they don't, but they should know that you care because if you care and you're, you're, and they're your friends, then they will care. And I think that's number one. Number two, kids. Some people say, oh, I don't want to get my, my kids involved and they shouldn't hear what's going on. Wrong. I think that this is an opportunity for education, an opportunity to help to bring them in Yesterday, I had a call from a family that wants to bring about five or six families, about 20, 25 people to Israel in December with their kids. And I said, what do you, why do you want to do that? Why do you want to expose them? They said, no, we want to bring them because we want to teach our kids what Zionism is all about. We want to volunteer. No, we don't want to, volunteer. like I said, they don't want to volunteer. They want to work. They want to help. And we want our kids to understand what, what the values are. Now, I'm not saying now to bring all your kids to Israel. I don't expect expect that at all. But do involve them. Have them write letters to soldiers. Have them um, understand what the right and what the wrong is. Have them understand what Israel means to us. What how can how Israel and Jews are connected. It's it's one of togetherness, and it's the funny thing I'm saying this the way that the Hamas are brainwashing their kids to hate and to kill, we need to be the opposite. We need to teach our kids to love, to respect, to understand the difference between right and wrong, to teach to love their Judaism, to teach to love Israel. I think that's what's important. And that's the contrast that we're giving to the Hamas. Third thing is, I know that people have been donating money and that's amazing. My suggestion is, I don't know how long this is going to last. A week, two weeks, a month, two months, more. I don't know. I don't think many people do know. Um, and I'm not even telling you what they're estimating because I think they're all wrong. But I will tell you that Israel's going to need help physically, but also financially, also in two months from now. If everybody rushes now to give money to the local federation and to the local this and to local that, they don't even know where that money's going to. That's fine, but I would probably, maybe Rabbi Solomon, I don't know, maybe Rabbi Graber as well, is to create a fund that you hold on to. And in a month from now, in a month and a half from now, when things are getting worse, God forbid, and I'm saying, listen, my son's unit is still fighting, and it's December, and they're cold, there's not enough fleeces. Can you get me $1,000 so I can buy the 20 fleeces for, for my son's unit because there's 300,000 soldiers out there and we can't get fleeces to everybody. That's what I suggest. Is not right now throw money uh, to the local Jewish Federation. I don't even know where that money goes. Just find out where your money is going. I'm sure it's going to good places, but I don't know where. Um, it could be going to soldiers. It could be going to helping the South. But the South, for example, will be needing help. in When this whole thing is over, we're going to need to rebuild their towns, rebuild the kibbutzim, rebuild the uh, cow sheds and the 
chicken coops and the agriculture that was all burnt by the Hamas um, will need it. And I would say is to hold off for a little bit. You know, I think that people like to give at the beginning a lot, a lot, a lot. Let's let's hold on to a fund and say, okay, now's the time we need it. And I can go to Rabbi Solomon and I can say, you know, Rabbi Solomon, I'm going to to uh, to this unit. They're, they they don't have socks. Let me buy socks. Let, let's see how I can do that. And that was a problem, by the way, about two weeks ago. There's no socks left in Israel. Okay, um, so a friend of mine uh, sent over a suitcase filled with like 500 pairs of socks, um, which I hope caught here and went to the soldiers. Um, but that's my suggestion is to have a fund that could be used directly to people that we know and not through 10 different hands until it gets to somewhere um, because we might need it in the future, but hold on to it, not give it now. Um, I guess that's my suggestion currently. Kids, kids, kids speak up. Kids, funds, and uh, like I said, be active on social media. Yeah, and be patient, uh, be long-term thinking, not just short-term thinking. JJ, you have given so much of your soul, your neshama here. We are incredibly grateful to you. I, I know I speak for everyone here that we are just holding, I know not just you and your family, although that is included, but all the Israel Maven family, but everyone truly in Israel, both Jews and non-Jews, all citizens who are bound together, including, as you noted, Bedouin. There were many different people who have been deeply affected, killed, um, and still suffering um, south, north, other places. We are, we, we, we feel as one and we want to let you hope you'll continue to convey that to your Hevra and people you see and let people know. Um, what, what I want to say is that, I, that I'm taking very much uh, JJ's advice to heart. So I'm going to keep thinking about how me and Rabbi Graber can talk about what we might do in our local communities here to continue on in the longer term. If you wish to, of course, at this point, I think most people know how to get in touch with JJ. If you wish for the future, um, you know, Israel Maven's website's there and JJ is extremely active with Rabbi, Rabbi so, um, please share within my email if anybody wants to email me. I'm not a problem. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. We'll, we'll put that at the end of this as well. Um, we just want to just thank you from the bottom of our hearts, JJ. And we really I would, truly I would like to end with one there. thing, Rabbi Solomon, if that's okay. Yep. I'm looking at this painting behind me. Yeah. I don't know if anybody can see it. Um uh it was a it's a very dear painting that was done for for us for hard times that my family went through. Um, and it's it's a chaim. It's the tree of life, um, and you can see at the bottom of it there's there's two hands holding up the tree. I don't know if you can see it over here. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, it says in the in the it says in the pasuk it says etz chaim he la machazikim ba for those who hold it. Um, and um, I believe that these two hands are the people of Israel, the Jews around the world, and our country is the etz chaim. Is art is the tree of life, because that's what we believe in, is life, to giving life, to preserving life, to saving life. Unfortunately for them, our enemies do the opposite, and they they preserve death. And I um I hundred percent believe in this painting that we together are going to hold up the tree of life. Thank you. That is incredibly powerful, JJ. We mamash todaraba. We wish you much hatslacha bracha. Love the Holy One just give you strength and all of Israel's strength, your family strength, Israel Maven strength. Um, I also want to show hopefully I'll give you a hug in person. I, I don't know if I told you, but I'm going on a, a solidarity trip, as I did tell you actually. We were sorry in about two weeks. So, and people on this call have been asking very it'll be announced more. I'm going to be, I've been, I will, of course, me and I think Rabbi Graber is considering as well, trying to make it work as well. So, but there's a group about 20 rabbis from North America going on a special solidarity trip. Hopefully, I'll give you a hug in person. Some have asked me, can they? Can I bring certain things like socks? I want you to know that, that that's not going to be possible. We're not. We're bringing just a carry on. It's a very short trip. I'm not bringing. You can bring two pairs of socks. Time. Two pairs of socks. Right, no, I'll be happy to leave what I have, but um, but I'm not doing that. We're going to be giving it to Tzedakah, though. So that's what we're encouraging them to do at this time. But I think JJ's points well taken. It's something for us to think about deeply about how we can elongate and continue the effort over the long haul. JJ, we're not afford to say thank you enough. Everyone here is saying beautiful thank yous in the chat. I hope you see that. that. Thank you so much. Um, the love is there. And uh, just feel our hug as, as much as we can. Everyone, Am Yisrael Chai, we will get through this together, God willing. We've been through horrible things in the past. This is uniquely horrible, honestly. This is uniquely horrible in the history of the Jewish people, certainly the history of the state of Israel. But God willing, we will, we will, we will, we will survive and thrive in the long term. Amen. Thank okay, you very much.
Lalitov, a sweet night, please, God. Okay, safe night. Cold tube, everybody. Shalom.